Welcome everyone today to our evening with Charles Eisenstein. We're really excited. I'm excited. And I've just loved the conversations with Charles last year and also in other events. It's a huge inspiration and really looking at things from a fresh angle. And tonight, the title of the evening is Trusting What the Heart Knows. And Charles said actually last year that it makes sense to trust what the heart knows beyond evidence in a world of conflicting information where our mind alone can no longer provide an adequate navigation system. And as I said yesterday evening, I think we're coming to the realization that our mind could never provide by itself an adequate navigation system. And maybe that's part of the waking up that humanity is doing at the moment to really understand that we need our whole body, we need our heart to navigate in these times. And as always, we're translating to German and Ukrainian. And we will also have an update from COP27 today. This is a little surprise for you and I'll intro introduce Caroline to you in just a moment. She's currently right in the negotiations in COP and will be calling from there to us. So we've got a journey ahead and we would like to prepare a vessel so that we can travel well together. And as always, we start with this vessel the beautiful sacred piece of land that we call body, which is closest to us. And I invite us all to snuggle up more closely to our own bodies. And for some of us, that might be a very simple thing to do, to come close to my body. And for some of us, the body is also, or for all of us, the body is also a place where unintegrated parts live. So both the, the flow and the connectedness, and also the parts where we contract and shy away. Let's close our eyes. And today we, I would like to invite us into our a deepened relationship with our breath. Just noticing for a moment that if my body is the land, literally the land, the, the land that is built through the ancestry that went before, the DNA that I carry, the wisdom, the resources, and also the unintegrated parts that I carry in my DNA, in my cells. There's also the minerals that make up my body. The water. And I wonder whether if our body was land, whether our breath could be seen as the sea. And maybe just for a moment, you can imagine yourself to be standing on the beach of your body and watching your breath 
as if it was the waves of the sea rolling in and rolling out. Maybe noticing the firm earth underneath your feet, the big horizon and sky around you. Watching the waves of your breath flow onto the land of your body, into the land of your body. And then withdrawing, flowing back out into the sea. And just see whether you can hmm. there's a sound coming through. Let's just make sure that everyone is muted. Scott. Thank you. So a little wave of sound entering our space. And just coming back to the, the waves of our breath. As you notice your, the land of your body being present, receptive for your breath. Let's just stay with the breath for a few in and out breaths and just see, notice whether you can shift from breathing to allowing yourself to be breathed. from needing to take your breaths to just allowing them to stream in, allowing the breath to stream in allowing the breath to stream out. Allowing your body to be breathed rather than breathing. And just see what it feels like to let go of needing to, in a way, push our breaths a bit control our breaths a bit and allowing our breath to bring the rhythms of nature into our body, the rhythms of the waves on the shore, the rhythms of ebb and flow, the rhythms of day and night, the rhythms of the waxing and the waning of the moon, and uh, deepening our understanding that we are so deeply embedded in these rhythms through 
the rhythm of the inflow and the outflow of our breaths. And now we can use, we can come home to this rhythm in order to connect more deeply to this piece of nature that is our body. Yeah, and with that, I invite you to open your eyes slowly. And as we move to gallery view and welcome each other with our eyes, just see whether we can become fully aware of the shared breathing rhythm. This miracle that we're all being breathed right now. that there is a pumping of our hearts, a rhythm of our hearts that's alive in all of us right now. And just see for a moment whether you can relate to this music that we are making or that is played through us, a rhythmic movement, a dance. Yeah, thank you. And I invite you to Keep a memory of this deep connection to rhythm in your own body, in your own emotions, in your own mind, your inner space, and also in our group vessel throughout this evening. As we listen to the voices and we witness together. Yeah, we're going to be traveling to Sharm El Sheikh now to the conference where yeah, voices are being heard that it's not so easy for representatives of civil society that are there, that there's it's not an easy time for people. And we're going to be hearing from Caroline. Mayor Toby, who is, was born in Trinidad, Tobago, moved to London for a while and has now moved back to her home territory in the Pacific Islands. And she has over 10 years experience in public and international environmental law. She's a former lawyer at the Foundation of International Environment Law and Development, advising small islands and develop, developing countries on UN climate change negotiations specifically. Yeah, and she has also published widely on the environment, on climate change, on human rights, on business, on human rights and conservation. And she's currently the founding director of the Institutes of the Small Islands. And these past days, she's been accompanying and being part of the delegation from Trinidad and Tobago at the negotiations. And she's actually in the negotiations, negotiations right now where they've been discussing loss and damages 
which we've heard about in the past days. So I imagine that Caroline is here now. Hi, Caroline. Thank you for being here. You're still muted, so you just need to unmute yourself. Hi, how are you? Here oh, I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, we can hear you. So I'll just pass. Yeah, that's great that you could just show us the space. I see people have gone home. It's the end now. of the yeah. day. So this is one of the main plenaries called Ramsey's. This is where I sat in the overflow because, you know, I, they wouldn't let me sit next to heads of states, of course. <laughs> but um, we're here at Sharm El Sheikh. The negotiations are in process. It's the first week. Um, and it's it's going. It's going. It's been intense. There have been a lot of logistical difficulties. I think that's why there's been a lot of silence, because a lot of people have just been getting lost and trying to find their way. Um, you know, just on a personal level, it's been quite difficult because it's a massive, massive complex. Um, I, we thought that Glasgow was huge and lots of walking, but I can tell you my heels are killing me. Sorry, somebody's passing with music. So if you hear that, my apologies. Um, there's been, it's been difficult to get water. <laughs> so, you know, thirsty in a desert is not a good, a good position. Um, signposting is a bit difficult so i've been quite late to meet my minister a couple of times running around like a crazy chicken without a head um but i'm so glad to be here with you thank you so much for having me so yeah. i don't know <laughs> no it's, it's just wonderful to have you caroline and you know we'd love to hear a bit about what motivated you you know your roots what motivated you to get active in this way you know, to study law, coming where you come from, like what was the motivation and what moves you at the moment? Well, I, I'm, um, I grew up a bit, I don't want to say confused, but in the sense that I'm, I'm, I'm mixed race from the Caribbean. So I'm um, black and Chinese and Indian, uh, East Indian, indigenous and various different types of European and, and Jewish as well. So, um, I didn't belong to a tribe, so I used to read quite widely and I realized that I just wanted to know more about my history. So I went into literature quite, you know, quite intensely and um, this and read the stories of, of, of what had happened. And, and I was exposed to colonialism at a very young age. I read um, Eric Williams um, book on, uh, I think it was capitalism and slavery and, and the, very very young and so when you read things at that age you um you get he, it stays with you and so i i tried to find my way in the world i i studied caribbean post-colonial literature caribbean and did some continents and african post-colonialism at um university of pennsylvania where of course that was not a subject so i had to create it for myself i had to go through the course um materials every semester and cobble it together i would look at ethnomusicology yeah. Caroline, just one thing, we have two translators. This is being translated to German and Ukrainian. If you could just go just a little bit slower, that would be great. Thank of course, I'm so sorry, I'm a speed talker with the, yeah. Um, so when I wanted to find out my history and I went to books first, I went to literature first. And when I did that, I, and patched together the history that does wasn't taught in 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 school books we were taught in school books for example that indigenous peoples had disappeared from the caribbean and were extinct and i was like wait my grandmother's part indigenous how is that possible you know and there's a carib community and all of these things and so i decided to go into law because i felt like i wanted to talk to the world as opposed to just you know um critics and students and who knew that academia was the place to be right now. And I, um, I went into international law because I realized that here was a place where people were talking back to empire. They were talking back to the global North. They were talking back against the legacies of colonialism. And that for me is what climate justice has been about. 
And so for me, this has been a really difficult space to, to navigate, but it, it's very fulfilling because um, small islands have been taking on the world order when it comes to climate change. And we've been quite adamant. And so the Alliance of Small Island States at the negotiation is a collection of Caribbean and Pacific and some African countries who are not taking no for an answer right now. We are standing up on 1.5. We are standing up on climate justice. We are standing up on loss and damage. And it's really quite beautiful to see. Um, and I'm so glad that you guys have talked about trauma and climate trauma um, because that's something that really interests me. Um, what is the collective trauma of having being owned? What is the collective trauma that's passed down from slavery? What is the collective trauma that passes down through indigenous descendants and knowing what happened to your ancestors was a genocide. So for me, climate justice isn't only environmental, it's cultural, it's social, it's financial, um, the evisceration of cultures, the um, slow death of religions. You know, I support wh where this has taken me is not just the negotiations. I've actually tried to go beyond the negotiations because civil society doesn't have a voice in the negotiations. It's only member states. And so, for example, we've been working with indigenous and maroon indigenous communities across the Caribbean basin. Um, maroon is a word for, uh, for former slaves that uh, liberated themselves through, through violence, obviously they had to, and um, they lived in enclaves. And so they kept their West African mostly, not only, but mostly West African, usually Yoruban, traditions and if you look at the pantheon of west african gods and um something like say voodoo voodoo is considered to be witchcraft by a lot of people it's not it's their religion it's a valid religion it's a syncretic form that was um mixed in with catholic with catholic spirits to hide the fact that they were retaining their own culture which is powerful Imagine having to fight to worship your gods and being called a witch and being demonized and being ostracized by community. And um, I'm going to be really cheesy here and I'm going to sing a song that, you know, this is just to show you, this was a really popular calypso in my country. And um, this was by people who were westernized, making fun and, of something, a religion that's like food. It was called Obia. Um, Melba, oh, yeah, making wedding plans, carrying the name to Obia, man. Obia, all you do, can't get true. I still let go marry to you. And then they go on, you're making yourself a papi show, Melba. You're making yourself a bloody clown. All up and down the road looking for Obia. And your perspiration smelling strong. So he's mocking her. He's talking about how she wants to get married. And so she's trying to put an obia spell on somebody. And she's, you know, looking for the obia, I guess, materials. And she's walking up and down and she's sweating and she's smelling bad. So it's mocking, you know. And so this is what we've self-internalized. What kind of trauma does that do to somebody? What kind of trauma does to self-internalize? So this is why for me, climate justice is about stories. It's about culture. It's about reclaiming the past, reclaiming your voice, reclaiming your narrative and reclaiming your ancestors. And that is the only way we can move forward in this earth to a bright and brave new future of just respecting each other. That's all it is, it's respect. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much, Caroline. And it's it's amazing how we're hearing 
um, how, so, you know, voices of women that we've heard over the past days keep bringing the same message in different ways from different areas on the earth. And it's like one voice speaking a very, very strong message. And I love that you brought that song because just the insidiousness, you know, how, how putting down life, putting down beauty, putting down female power, but also putting down the strength of nature, how that has been brought into the language, into the songs, and is, you know, fed. Um, yeah, and we sometimes keep feeding it to each other. So thank you so much. I think that was an amazing example and an amazing message. And we'll just send our love and our care. We could just for a moment be with you in silence and send our love to you as you continue doing this work and send our love through you to the Caribbean and Trinidad and Tobago. And I felt like even through your voice, we could catch a glimpse of the rhythm of the islands. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Yeah, be well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we appreciate it just so much that people, you know, who are, and please, Caroline, take a moment just to read the, the chat also and drink it in. Yeah, and with that, you know, we're going to maybe just allowing this voice from the Caribbean to sink deeply into us and join the voices that we heard in the past days. We want to welcome Charles Eisenstein, who is an essayist, the author of several books, including The More Beautiful World, Our Hearts Know is Possible. But most especially, I think that from the first time I heard Charles speak, what touched me is that I feel that he is a channel for heart energy. <laughs> Maybe I can say it like that. And every time I hear Charles speak, it's like fresh water coming down the mountain. It's always fresh. It's always new. And I'm really happy to share with you that Charles is currently in Costa Rica with his family for two weeks of also spaciousness in a very busy life, serving the world as he does as a speaker and writer and mover and shaker. I think not shaker so much, more mover and whisper and inspire. Yeah, I, I think it's beautiful that that also brings in the topic of how we combine, how we bring together the most deeply intimate and personal with our biggest world work. So Charles, welcome here with us. Welcome to you. Hi, uh, hi Kosha. That's, um, thank you for such a kind and generous introduction. Yeah, not at all. It's a very yeah. humble introduction, I think, for yeah, expressing what I've what I've experienced multiple times. So yeah, and I think, you know, um Caroline was just speaking about the power of story and the, you know, also the river of story, how it creates us and how it's our narratives that need to change. And I know that you also work a lot with story, you know, narratives and Mm -hmm. I wonder whether we could start just by speaking to the story of separation. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, you know, also whether you have a sense of how the pain that we carry, Caroline was speaking about the pain, you know, the power and the pain that comes through lineage, how that might feed into the story of separation. Yeah. Um I'd kind of prefer not to start with, um, you know, uh, abstract <laughs> philosophy, but I'd, I'd like to maybe continue on from what some of Caroline was saying. Great. Um, Over 
Yeah, I really appreciated the invocation of uh, wudu um, because it is so often used as a term of disparagement and and a a like okay I, I, it, it stirred something up in me because a couple of years ago i wrote uh, an essay actually called the banquet of whiteness uh commenting on the treatment uh, of an african doctor uh, who became very very controversial uh her name was stella uh stella emmanuel and she advocated politically unpopular treatments for COVID. <clears throat> and, and, you know, so she was basically the object of character assassination. And so people dug up all kinds of stuff about how she believes that, that uh, you know, possession by demonic spirits can cause illness and how she was educated in medical school in Nigeria. Yes, that Nigeria said the headline in what was what was supposed to be a left, you know, a liberal publication. And I was like, hold on a second. What worldview are we reifying as true and sane when we use voodoo as a term of disparagement? Which as as Caroline said, it's actually like a very sophisticated syncretic religion of where, where indigenous people met the onslaught of Christianity and found ways to fold it into their own culture and belief systems uh, that that could um, enable them to, to get under the radar. Like it looked kind of like Christianity from the outside, you know, but they were able to to maintain some cultural integrity there. And and yeah, like it is commonplace not only in voodoo but in pretty much any pretty like most that i know of at least indigenous belief systems that um that illness and possession by evil spirits i.e well we could translate that into the term psychology that like they they're related you know so what where where do we stand ontologically when we uh, use that as a as an insult, and and like then like on a more subtle level, and this I'm going to wrap this into climate change actually, um, because <clears throat> respect for so what what post colonialism is, <clears throat> it's not just okay we have to treat them nicer, <laughs> you know treat the, the 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 world's people who we've genocided and colonized and enslaved and exploited we have to treat them a little nicer and this was the banquet of whiteness and give them more uh scraps from the table or allow them a seat at the table allow them a seat at the banquet assuming arrogantly assuming that this is the banquet that we should be having and i said actually you know you look at the the food set on this table and it's not gourmet cuisine it's hot dogs and cheese fries you know this is not do, do we really want to make the whole world like us so this globalist um paradigm that rests on we live better than you we know better than you um we know reality better than you do this takes very subtle forms. And one of those forms that I'd like to just kind of bring into this space is the way that we narrate climate change as, or I would even expand it beyond that to say the ecological crisis. When we narrate it as something um, that is primarily global, and primarily a matter of um, scientific metrics um, for a, a, a global quantity, then let us ask what ways of knowing and what relationships between people and land are left out of that 
uh, approach to the problem. So <clears throat> trying to make a trying to make a pretty big leap here. Um, but I guess you know I wrote a book on climate as well, and and one of the main points is that um, the ecological crisis is much, much bigger than can be attributed to greenhouse gases. So in places like the Caribbean, for example, uh, you know, vast areas of mangrove swamps have been destroyed. Wetlands have been drained, forests have been cut down, um, uh, co coastal areas have been developed. Uh, developed. I mean, even there, you know, part of the colonial mindset comes through. That's progress. It wasn't developed before, but development kind of presupposes this arc of human society. There's the undeveloped, and then we develop and develop kind of like a child develops and grows up. So <clears throat> all of that ecological damage creates um, the trauma that we're talking about when, when you know, the mangroves aren't there to buffer the storm surge, for example, when the forests aren't there to absorb the rains and the wetlands aren't there to absorb the rains and replenish the aquifers so that they all run off, all the water runs off, then you have drought and the flood drought cycle <laughs> and the forests start to burn because the other forests start to burn and the rains no longer come because the forests aren't bringing them in anymore through the biotic pump effect. And so there's all these, these, um, and this is still like a, a level of science, but then what happens, like let's take it a level deeper when traditional practices of communicating, or let's even say communing with the land and yes, the spirits of the land, of the ancestors, of the animals, of the mountains, you know, of the rivers, like <clears throat> traditional culture was in constant communication with nature as not as a um, bunch of mechanical and chemical processes, but as a, as a living being in its entirety that was home also to living beings, bursting with living beings. And that that human beingness and human culture and the way that we live and the way that we treat each other is inextricable from the well-being of nature. So it's not so I guess you know that climate justice is more than recognizing that the effects of the ecological crisis visit up upon the world's poor and disenfranchised more than they do the world's, world's wealthy. That's part of it. But another part is, is, is recognizing that we have lost our way, we as the dominant culture, or the apparently dominant culture, we have lost our way. And we need to relearn how to be human in relationship to all the beings of nature. So that was kind of a wide circle. Um, I hope that was, uh, uh, I guess so it's just to say about story then. Um, part of our dilemma here, part of our, our imprisonment, I would even call it, is that we are trapped in that way of seeing of nature as an other. And we're making progress now. We're understanding that in some sense, what we do to the rest of life is we cannot shield ourselves. Like whatever we do to the world happens to us as well. We're starting to understand that as, as a society. That's really what the, the basic consciousness underneath the climate movement is. It's understanding that we're not separate from all of these beings human beings and other beings that we've strip mined and exploited and so forth. But we're still, we still have not as a culture made the step of seeing nature and species and rivers and mountains as actual beings. 
that's it's still a very um, mechanistic. Um, like they're still they're not beings. Like so, we're still alone here. That's that's really part of the story of separation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Charles, for starting where you started, and and in a way, I'd love to go deeper into that exploring how the you know seeing all of the world as spirited as inhabited by spirit that that could be put down right you know which is where we started but i feel that you've just so powerfully brought to our attention this um the reality also of what is happening at cop where 95% of conversations that I have heard at COP are taking place in that imprisonment of a language of money and chemical equations and GDP. And, you know, yesterday we spoke about the fact that the restoration cannot be monetized reparations to a people that have experienced genocide cannot be monetized we spoke about the fact that loss and damages cannot be monetized and that you know this question of well what is needed then because yes you know a flow of resources is needed that can be part of the answer. You know, um, Caroline is right now part of the negotiations fighting for loss and damages, also in terms of financial payments. But there is something else that is needed, which is our turning towards the original transgression of sacred law and being with that, or turning towards the, the deep grief of loss that people are going through that are losing their island that are losing their lands that are where people are dying in a typhoon like we heard from sarah from the philippines and i wonder whether you know because in a way you're speaking to that point of how we can turn with our hearts towards what is happening and come to the actual point of meeting and relationship mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Here's a here's a good example to to illustrate what some of what you're saying. Um, like, suppose that that someone invented a device that could a big machine that could remove carbon from the air and sequester it in the ground. Uh, and as long as we frame the the ecological crisis in terms just of carbon dioxide. Then we could say, ah, great, problem is solved. All we have to do is install these giant machines everywhere. And um, then we can continue to do as we have done all over the world. Like, I think all of us understand that that is not actually the result that we are fighting for, <laughs> that we are, I mean, well, fighting for, that we are, that we are committed to, that And, and in fact, there are solutions that are kind of tantamount to that. When that that's what naturally happens when you identify green as in in terms of carbon, uh, where you make the equation of green and low carbon, then you end up with policies that that actually perpetuate the kind of exploitation of nature and culture that has been going on. You know, throughout the colonial period, uh, for example, like right now, uh, old growth forests in Eastern Europe and actually in the U.S. are being destroyed, um, cut down, and then converted into wood pellets to be burned at at converted coal plants that then get carbon credits, or you know, um, they 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 produce so-called zero carbon um, energy. 
Like that's happening all over the place and, and vast landscapes are being converted into biofuels too, as part of this gigantic land grab in, especially in Africa. And, you know, then there's the problems with, with, um, you know, batter, like the batteries and all the, the lithium mining and cobalt mining and silver mining and all that has to happen to. So like, we're kind of actually doing this and what's it going to take to stop that? It's, it's going to take something more than better metrics. And I'm not saying we shouldn't use metrics, but I'm saying they have to be animated by real relationship and by a recognition of earth as a being and water as a being. One of the, one of the Kogi said, put it really well, I thought, um, he was speaking of the destruction of the coastal wetlands in Colombia, um, which, anyway, there's a whole story there, but he said, if you knew she could feel, you would stop. And I think he identified the core of it. If you knew she could feel, you would stop. In other words, if you knew that you were doing this to an actual being, then your compassion would awaken. It's the same with any kind of objectification. Like, like um, abuse of women. It kind of requires dehumanization first. You have to make her into someone who's not really a someone, you know, into a, a, a collection of body parts, into a, a, an object, into something less than fully human. And once you've done that, then you can abuse her. Once you've done that to a person, you can exploit them. Once you've done that to, to um, you know, you can even enslave them, you can incarcerate them, you can kill them. And when we do that to nature, when we reduce it to something less than sacred, when we reduce it to resources, when we reduce it to raw materials, then only self-interested calculation will limit us in what we do to earth. And that's why um, I, I, another awakening that I'm starting to see happen in the climate movement that I think is really important is the understanding that our motivation in this movement is not actually about the survival of civilization or the survival of humanity. How do I know that? Or how, how can you know that? Well, let me paint another scenario here. Suppose that we develop technological, sub, those, those carbon sucking machines to, to control the atmosphere. And, and maybe we bleach the sky with sulfur aerosols to you know, help modulate the temperature. And, and maybe we um, replace soil and plants with lab grown meat and lab grown food and, and hydroponics factories. And suppose that we create technological substitutes for everything that nature does. Suppose that we could do that and the entire earth is converted to one huge strip mine and parking lot. Have we won? We saved humanity and maybe we have virtual reality replicas of everything we've destroyed. So is that what we are serving? We are not, that would not be acceptable. What we are really serving is life. What we are really serving is beauty. And that, you know, sometimes we can use the conventional climate narrative, the carbon narrative to serve life and beauty. We can say, hey, this rainforest, it's, um, you know, got a lot of embedded carbon. It sequesters X kilotons of carbon per year. Or we could say, you know, this, this fishery, um, the ecosystem services are worth whatever billion a year. But when we do that, we're actually not standing in truth because our sense of value of these beings, beings, these beings, our sense of value 
it does not assign them a value of only $7 billion and accept that if we could make 10 billion by draining the wetlands and you know, destroying the coral reef and cutting down the forest, then we should do it because that's how much it's worth. No, that's not honest. Actually, it is infinitely precious. And that doesn't mean that, that we never cut down a tree for any reason whatsoever. It's just that we never do that under the illusion that it is anything other than a sacred being. So we enter into then respect for life. And that is the transition that the climate crisis is begging of us, begging of us, not forcing us. I used to think that the climate emergency would force us to change. Now I think that it is posing us a choice and saying, what kind of earth do we want to live on? Yeah, right. So, you know, this infinite preciousness, and as you speak about it, you bring that part in us alive that knows this, right? We all know this in our hearts. And yet, when you spoke about the degradation of the earth, you know, the Kogi who said, if you knew she was alive, you would stop. If you knew she could feel, you would stop. If you knew she could feel, you would stop. Um, that we have for so long, you know, most of us here on the call are somehow connected to the Western world in some way. We're connected to a past, wherever we come from, where there was cruelty and transgression of sacred law so we carry what you know we in the pocket project would call trauma within us a place where we know of the preciousness but somehow the trust has been broken that this preciousness would be recognized and respected somewhere the trust has been broken and the ensuing witnessing or perpetrating or being victim of the ensuing cruelty and destruction has been too much to bear. And, you know, the, the, the feeling that we're carrying parcels of this unconscious memory in our human global spheres, our, our collective spheres, you know, our ancestral spheres, our personal spheres, and that there are parts in each of us that are not completely with life. You know, we're, we're not turning towards life. And so, you know, even if we know she feels, even if we know she feels on a cognitive level, we're no longer able to fully know that on a physical level, you know, as fully embodied human beings. So, you know, in, because I, I feel like sometimes we're also in danger of saying, you know, we're the ones who know that life is sacred, you know, and somewhere over there are the ones who do the strip mining and they don't know that life is sacred, you know. And what we often find when we come closer and closer and closer and closer is actually that the, these lines run through each of us. So I would like to know more from you about that, maybe even on a personal level, you know, where do you grapple with that? Or where do you watch us grapple with that, you know, because we... We grapple with that within ourselves. You know, yesterday we had someone speak out really strongly and we had us here in the audience respond and say, yes, I can feel the perpetratorship in my lineage. I feel guilt. I feel shame. You know, how do we work with that? How do you work with that within yourself? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the story 
you know, the story of separation that says Earth is not a being, so of course she can't feel, is part of a much, much bigger complex um, it, that includes a way of life, that includes um, a, a psychology, that includes really it's a whole state of being. And simply um, replacing some opinions about um, the world or professing different beliefs and saying, no, now I believe that Earth is alive. Uh, now I believe that what happens in the world happens to me in some way. Now I believe that if human beings are incarcerated, part of me is locked up. Now I believe that when a species goes extinct, something in me dies as well. That's a good start. But by itself, as you're saying, um, just having this cognitive belief that Earth can feel, it's, it, 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 it's not a very big change. And, and it can be like what someone professes to believe and what someone actually believes could be two different things. The, but also, like, so I don't want this to turn into a bludgeon that we, that we use to, to try to guilt ourselves into change because that um, force based um, coercing of really what, what, because what are we? What are we? We are life. And everything that we do is what life does when it is in the circumstances that it is in. We like to think in our culture that when people do bad things, it's because they are bad people. And that sets us up for judgment. And it also presents us with a false solution to a problem, which is get rid of all the bad people, get rid of the bad parts of ourselves. That mindset is actually part of the problem. It's the, it's the mindset of conquering nature. Where did the first idea of bad come from? Stone Age cultures did not have a concept of evil. It came with agriculture, with the first, the, with the beginnings of the conquest of nature when the weeds were bad and the corn was good and the sheep were good and the wolves were bad, and that we could make a better earth by destroying the bad and, and expanding the good. And then we turn that inwards as well. When we recognize, so this gets back to trauma, you know, and, and, and so when we, because um, then we ask, okay, what are the circumstances under which we continue to perpetrate the, the destruction of life and beauty on earth. And then we start to, when we ask that question, then we become able to do something about it. We might not know what to do about it, but at least we're stepping into reality. So, you know, a lot of it is, for example, the economic system. And, and when we really ask, okay, why are, um, you know, the, um, land grabbers in Brazil, uh, the, and the, the, you know, the ranchers, you know, why, and, and the, the uh, loggers, the log poachers, you know, why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? When we get past this, this reaction of hating them and dehumanizing them, and we really ask why, the answer, first of all, it gets very complicated, uh, and it has to ultimately you know, and it comes down to, or at least one of its roots is an extractive economic system that um, lends money at interest to so-called developing nations like Brazil, and then requires that they pay back the money in hard currency, which they can only get through um, selling their natural resources and their labor. And that systemic pressure filters down and the result is that desperate people are doing whatever it takes to meet their debt obligations, which are enforced ultimately by violence. So, so, the, so it gets very complicated and you can't really hate them anymore because you think, gosh, 
if I were in that situation, I might be doing that too. And the th other thing that happens is that you realize that you're part of the situation. <laughs> you know, we're all part of the situation. And, and it's not because we're bad people. Like even I was having this conversation yesterday about, you know, uh, publicly traded companies and how rapacious they are and how they don't have a conscience, you know, and, and, and my friend was talking about, yeah, it's all like all those old white guys in the boards of directors and so forth, pushing them to maximize profit. But, you know, I was like, you know, a lot of those directors are, they represent pension funds and they're desperate to get a 5% return so that they can meet their pension obligations to teachers and, and public servants, you know, whoever else is in the, in the unions. And, and so we're all stuck in a system that does not serve human well-being. And some of us might be lodged in very comfortable situations in that system. And others might be in very uncomfortable situations because part of the way the system works is it meets out privilege to some and lesser degrees to privilege of others. And, you know, it's, it's a whole self-perpetuating system. But actually, even that is an illusion. Um, and I know that from my interactions with happy people, very few of whom are to be found in Beverly Hills or the Hamptons or Malibu or the wealthy parts of this world where people have no community and no connection to other beings, human and non-human, where they lack intimacy and, and meaning and belonging and the identity, the sense of self that comes from rich relationships. You find a lot more happy people in small villages in India than you do pretty much anywhere in the US. So even the discourse of privilege carries some of the assumptions of privilege. And this does not, not offer an easy solution. But anyway, to answer your question, you know, standing in a place of relative privilege in the conventional sense anyway, um, life as it manifests through me wants to use that to serve life. That's what life wants to do. Life creates the conditions for life. Life wants to live and who we are as life in human form is that we want to make the world more alive. And I would also say more beautiful. That's why we're here. And when any human being is not enacting that purpose, then we can ask with curiosity and not um, disparagement, but with curiosity, why? What has happened to you, my brother? that you are not expressing your nature to, to serve life and beauty on earth. What are the circumstances? And knowing that, maybe we can start to undo those circumstances. So I don't know, I hope that wasn't too um, abstract. No, absolutely not. Yeah, and it's, you know, basically that last sentence that you spoke, you know, instead of saying, what is wrong with you? Ask, wow, what happened to you? for this feeling to be so strong in you. And, and I feel, as you know, very passionate now after working for so many years in the Global Ecovillage Network and the movement of regeneration, and also seeing you know, that there is like, as we try to implement the dreams and the visions of the most beautiful world we know is possible, um, where we know we can regenerate ecosystems. I see that. But then still watching over the years how there is seems to be sand in the system, you know, sand in the system of humans working with humans, sand in the system of global movements trying to work together from different continents and trying to bridge the gap of, you know, what I would call the trauma of colonialism and the trauma of racism and the trauma of enslavement. And, you know, this, to notice 
as we dedicate ourselves to coming back to being alive with life, being in our aliveness with life, and then meeting these places in us where we get triggered by something and suddenly, instead of understanding, you know, that this other person is as human as I am, I suddenly see them as the enemy, right? And it can go in my most intimate relationship, you know, with my darling husband. It can happen within a minute, you know, that I shift from here's a person that I love more than anything in life to he's the enemy, you know, he's out to get me. He doesn't see me. He doesn't respect me, you know. And it even on that most intimate level, it happens like this, you know. And we do it to each other all the time. The one moment I see my darling colleague who sits here with us, Anna, as the beautiful human being she is, the next moment I might speak to her as somebody who needs to complete a task now, you know and lose track of the humanity of who we are. It's just this shifting environment. And I loved what you spoke about the, as we come closer to that level of intimacy and really tracking in our own nervous systems, wow, what happens? Where is the place where I plug into the preciousness, the depth of the immeasurable preciousness of the life that I am meeting And I move away from that to a place where I'm trying to protect myself in a foreign world, Um, trying to track that in my own nervous system. And in those places, becoming, as you say, loving with myself in that place where I feel myself contract instead of saying, that's the bad place in me, you know, to become loving with myself. But in... You know, that all of that takes place, as you say, in this incredible complexity of life. You know, once we start realizing, oh, the bad leaders are not out there, you know, they're a part of me. All those other, you know, points you made. So it's an incredible complex reality that we're starting to navigate from this extremely intimate place of Am I actually right now in a place of intra-being or not? Am I in a place of intra-being? Whereas Thomas says, I can actually feel you in me while I speak to you. Or am I slightly distanced? Am I a lot distanced? You know, this it's a very intricate movement we're trying to make, I feel. And I don't know where the question is at that, but it's... No, I mean, we, we, we are, we are and this is another aspect of post-colonialism. Um, we are endeavoring to undo habits that are thousands of years old. The colonizers became colonizers because they were themselves colonized. You know, if you look at the history of Europe and, and the trauma that, that began I mean, I don't even know if I could put a beginning date to it, but to take an arbitrary date, you know, the Roman Empire, uh, where in which the word colony was invented, you know, and and I mean, that's how they did it. They would go into a place, they would they would um, kill the elites and a lot of the people and replace them with their own elites, or they would buy them off. You know, I mean, it was the same kind of thing that the United States has done, um, you know, in the last century. And so, yeah, um, we are undoing, yeah, we are undoing very deep habits. And you named, you know, you described the, even in your like closest relationships, like they even infiltrate to that level, the habit of dehumanizing the other, the habit of making an enemy out of somebody, the habit of waging war against evil like of setting up the world into two camps, the good guys and the bad guys, and believing that you could solve the problem, whatever the problem is, by you know, winning this argument or uh, winning this election, defeating this person, removing them from power, winning a war. Like this is, this is the, the world that we create. And as long as we keep doing that, 
nothing is going to change because that's the root of all of our problems. Our, our, we don't have any serious, technically serious problems on earth. The like global hunger, um, climate change, ecological collapse. These could be, if, if we were unified and coherent, these problems could be solved very, very quickly. In my climate book, I did like a literally back of the envelope calculation, like how much farmland would we have to convert to regenerative practices to offset all carbon emissions? You know, it wasn't even, and then how much money would it take? It was like, you know, a tenth of the military budget. Like that's all it would take. Because uh, I mean, you know, you're you're in this movement too. You know, the, the people who are building like an inch of topsoil in three years. You know, the the miracles that are happening, like the 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 dried up springs that come back to life. You know, the I mean, or or to take the the example of hunger. I mean, more than enough food to feed all the world's hunger is wasted every year, and that's not even considering the amount of arable land that's devoted to lawn grass. And I mean, there are no technically difficult problems to solve right now. The only, the root of all of the problems is our incoherency. And what fuels that is a very ancient pattern of dehumanizing each other, which is the same pattern as the desacralizing of nature. And that's why I, I, do think a lot on this level of, of story, because when we dehumanize somebody, a story about them is, is part of it. I don't think it's the cause of it. It's more of a facilitator of it. It's, it because like you said, this, this cognitive level is just a very, it's just the shell. Yeah, beautiful. And, you know, I said at the beginning when this framework event started last Sunday, you know, I, I came to the conclusion like the, the progress I have seen is the collapse of believing in the one right solution mm -hmm. in our movements. Right. You know, I feel like I've, I've been watching, uh, collapse of this is the right way and that it still comes but it comes softer it comes like with a little bit of hmm am I, do i really believe in what i'm saying now you know maybe mm -hmm. i'm still saying this but actually i know that they're doing this and they're doing this and they're doing this and you know it feels like that i really feel is growing yeah and that's really good news i mean that's a kind of a humility of saying hmm maybe we don't know Maybe the way that we're tackling this new problem is the same way that we've tackled other problems. And what worldview is that based in? I mean, again, post-colonialism, you know, like that the basic idea of, okay, we've got a big crisis here. So let's find the enemy. You know, if, if we're talking about a crisis of American democracy, you know, each side has who they identify as the enemy that threatens democracy itself. In the case of, of climate change, it's, uh, and again, like I wanna, I, I, I almost don't even like, I mean, climate change is a symptom, in my view, a symptom of a, a million different forms of ecocide. It's just like if you, if you damaged, you know, two thirds of the organs and tissues in your body, and then you start getting fevers and, and, and your body temperature fluctuates up and down. That's because of the organ and tissue damage. And we've damaged every single organ and tissue of this, of this planet, more than two thirds. It's about 90%, actually. If you look at like the total fish biomass or the, or the number of whales or the you know, remaining seagrass meadows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a 10% world is what uh, J.D. McKinnon calls it, the, the uh, naturalist. So anyway, could we, just, could we just could we just pause there for a moment? Because I think for many of us, you know, to imagine that we've destroyed ninety percent of the fabric of life of our Earth, yeah, the insects. Is that is, it's it's really yeah. hard. It's really hard. Well, I notice I can take it in here, but it's 
you know, Thomas Hubel once said, if we would really feel this, allow our bodies to feel this, we would all sit here crying right now. You know, when somebody was crying and saying, hey, I'm so sorry, I'm crying. He said, you know, if the strange thing is that we're not all crying, you know. Yep. And but I, yeah, a, statistic, a statistic doesn't do it for me. You know, mm -hmm. what does it for me is seeing a place that I love that is destroyed. That's what brings me to tears. Because everybody's throwing statistics at us. So but where I was going with this yeah. Yeah. is this fundamentalism, like this, okay, here's this problem. What's the enemy? And then what do we do? We measure it, we convert it to a number, and then try to change the number. And if we can, if we can only change this one thing, everything will be okay. If we can only master this one quantity, all of our problems will be solved. That way of approaching problems is part of what we call, it's part of what we have, that, that is part of the worldview that, that has colonized the earth. So if we are going to be post-colonial in our climate and ecological work, we have to look at that. And we have to start looking at, okay, what do, how do indigenous people care for land? And do they use metrics? And maybe they do, but maybe they use other ways of sensing health as well. Alan Savory, the uh, generative rancher, Alan, Alan Savory, he says that he can't farm properly if he doesn't go barefoot because that's the way that the land speaks to him. You know, and, and, and he could do soil assays, you know, and all kinds of other stuff, scientific stuff. But the way he does it is that he goes barefoot. And, and I think that, we, as you were saying, like, we're hesitating a little bit in our certainty. Maybe we don't know. Maybe we need to look toward the surviving cultures, you know, the one that, that and maybe no culture is, has survived completely intact, but some of them have survived with a, with a fair degree of integrity through practices, for example, like voodoo, you know, where they kept, they sequestered off some knowledge that is contrary to the dominant uh, metaphysics, the dominant worldview. And now we got to go there. Like that's a precious container of true knowledge that we need to source and that we are becoming available for as we as we think, you know, like this is kind of the same pattern. This is the same, the same fight in a different form. And it's not working. We want to do something else. And we started today by, um, you know, I've been really touched by this shift in myself from breathing, which is, you know, what I do, especially when I work, I find I, I nearly struggle with my breath to allowing myself to be breathed. That mm -hmm. slight shift. And finding that when I just make that shift to me, to move from breathing to being breathed, it can become like an entrance door to a reality where I might also allow myself to be more in that, you know, a balanced place between doing and allowing myself to be moved by my inner soul motivation to do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as long as I feel like I have to do or I have to breathe, I tend to put an added bit of pressure, which leads to a whole myriad of small um, reactions, you know, pressure that creates pressure where it becomes so much harder, you know, mm -hmm. that the flow, like this movement from into flow 
happens on such a fine point, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, and as actually, we come, yeah, you know, I'm just realizing also we're coming to the end of our time. So it's like this, you know, the shift into the myriad of possibilities. And I, you know, which is also somehow the gateway where miracles, you spoke about the miracle of growing an inch of topsoil, you know, and how do we enter through that eye of the needle into the flow and the world of miracles and being connected, yeah. So I, what you're doing, what, you, what you're talking about with the breath is part of the same movement um, of reconnection and, and um, re-immersion in the totality of being and a different story. Because you, when you're talking about allowing the breath to breathe you, you're you're acknowledging an intelligence beyond your own where you don't have to control things you don't have to make yourself breathe you don't have to be in the driver's seat because the body has intelligence so that shift mirrors the shift of of our of of civilization's conception of itself and its role in the world where the what I call the old story, the technological story, defines progress as imposing more and more of our own design and intelligence onto a world that has none. We can, it's not just gonna be all chaos out there because we're gonna impose intelligence onto it because it's not intelligence, intelligent in and of itself. Consciousness and intelligence, those are only in human beings in that old story. And now as that is breaking apart, as we see the 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 promise of technolo technological utopia recede ever into the distance. Again, we're like maybe we don't have it right, and we open to being participants, <clears throat> not directors, but participants in a much bigger intelligence, and therefore our relationship to Earth. It's not that we step back and just let nature heal. It's that we ask, what is our role in participation in healing? What is ours to do? What wants to happen? What does the land want? What does the river want? I mean, these are questions of respect. In a relationship with a human being, you would like your partner to ask those questions. That's a mature relationship. What, what will serve you? Knowing, and it's not sacrifice, knowing that what serves you will serve me because we're not separate. Knowing what serves the water and what serves the soil and what serves the forest will serve us in a way much broader than our mere survival. Because we can survive potentially with technology on a dead planet. I would hate to think that, but that's my question. What if we could? Well, maybe we could, but what would survive? What in us dies when we see a strip mine and a clear cut? And what? how do we have to shrink to be okay with that? And so again, it comes down to who are we and what do we want to be? As we, as, and, and the, the opportunity, the, the threshold that we are at right now is to re-enter the larger beingness of all life. Yeah, beautiful. I think that's a wonderful place to stop. And it's the most perfect way of expressing it. Mm -hmm. ah, I feel like I would love you to I love to hear you say it one more time. The threshold that we're at. I would have, have to say it a different way, but <laughs> we, are, we are at the threshold. We are at the threshold of reunion. Reunion. We've gone so deep into separation, uh. and it's not an inevitability, but we have a choice now. Yeah. To begin the return journey. Yes, yeah, we're at the threshold of re-entering the web of life. 
re-immersing ourselves into the hoop of life, as Pat McCabe says. And something about the humility of not knowing brings us closer. Yeah. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you for your beautiful contribution to this journey that we're on for 12 and actually 13 days around COP27. Deepening, bringing, yeah, different stories to the table, as you say. You know, the importance of listening to other stories. And really hovering at this threshold and sometimes moving over it and then coming, you know. I feel mm -hmm. like this being on the threshold is actually a movement that we're on. Moving in and moving back. That's where we are. Thank you so much for hovering on this threshold with me mm -hmm. here. I'm very, very grateful for your voice and your presence in this world and in our movement. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, thanks, Kosha. And give our love to your lovely family and thank them for missing you for this time. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it was worth it. I, I, <laughs> I thank you for being such a gracious host. No. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, with that, we come to the end of the evening. And Ingrid, I have seen your hand. And I would so ask you to please write your comment or your question in the chat, if you can, please. Um, we had agreed, and I should have said it at the beginning. I apologize that because Charles, it just felt so precious that we wanted to use the time with him and not bring in questions, but I'd love to hear what you have to say, read what you have to say in the chat. So with that, coming to the end of today, honoring that we're at the threshold of reunion and our journey is continuing together. And I believe that making this journey together is what will get us across the threshold and acknowledging the places in each other not just where we feel connected it's important to share those places but sometimes i feel like it's even more important to start speaking with intimate honesty um, embodied honesty about the places where i numb out because it's too much for me where i withdraw because I get afraid and to share those places with each other also in deep compassion and love. And that's where the true um, reconnection happens. It's like when we can bring the love in the places of disconnect. Thomas Hubel sometimes says, love is not where love happens easily. Love emerges where it's a hard place for love to open like a flower. Those are not his words, but my words to try and bring back what he says. Yeah, so tomorrow we're turning our eyes towards Ukraine. We might even listen to some Ukrainian together. And Tomorrow is a special day because we will be meeting an hour earlier. I'll repeat that. We will be meeting one hour earlier than usual. <laughs> we will also be sending it out in the reminder and may it be possible for all of us to break our habits and arrive here an hour earlier. And we will be having another journey to communities on the front lines with Daria Yemets and Volodymyr Ganzura from Ukraine speaking to us. Volodymyr is the second in charge of the Ministry of Environmental Protection. This is in my words of Ukraine. And we'll be speaking about when war hits and there is no space to take care of environment, what happens? 
What happens when you need to take care of your life? And there's no time, no space, no energy left for the caretaking of the forests, of the animals. Now we need to reframe our regenerative plan considering dead bodies, war scrap, and bomb craters. How can we take care of the future when our present is under threat? So do join us. And as always, the recordings will be shared after these calls. Um, we're also sharing them actually with Ukrainian for our Ukrainian friends. And again, just inviting you, we'll send it out again to take time with your friends to watch the movie once you know. And it's so close to this saying of the Kogis, once we know that she feels, if you knew that she could feel, you would stop. And this movie is once you know, you can never be the same. And we're really looking forward on Sunday evening to speak to the director, Emmanuel Kaplan. And we invite you before that time to watch the movie with your neighbors, your friend, your children, your parents, your community. And yeah, welcome back tomorrow, one hour earlier and on Sunday. And let's just take a moment to come back to our gallery view and yeah. Share a moment of love for this breathing organism of a community here that has one beating heart and one breath. And I want to give a personal thank you to each of you because I know that I wouldn't be able to be here um, without you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And as always, thank you to our team. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Daria and Olena. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Scott. Be well, everyone.